arguably the most notorious and best-known experiment in the history of psychology. Stanley Milgram's infamous work ostensibly explored obedience to authority, but its enduring legacy is perhaps more due to the notion that it provides an uncomfortable insight into the nature of human evil, raising the possibility that any of us, given the right set of circumstances, could find ourselves hurting another human being for no other reason than an authority figure has told us to. This sobering observation hits hard, partly because we have a natural tendency to think that evil resides in and is enacted by certain kinds of individual. This way of thinking is of course reflected in popular culture, where evil acts are often committed by villains in books and films who are made to appear something monstrous or else otherworldly. The portrayal of evil as committed by extraordinary beings ultimately reassures us that we, in contrast, are ordinary and therefore not evil. The legacy of Milgram's work is a poignant observation. Sometimes evil acts are better explained by situational forces than they are by properties of the individuals who enact them. The story begins in the early 1960s with an American psychology professor deeply motivated to explore the psychological underpinnings of the atrocities associated with the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Participants in the classic version of the experiment had answered a newspaper ad for a study of memory at Yale University, for which they would be paid the quite generous sum at that time of $4. Turning up at Milgram's lab, they would be greeted by a white lab-coated assistant who explained the basic task to them. The naive participant would always be given the role of teacher, and the other participant, a trained actor, was given the role of learner. Participants learned that their task involved reading out a list of word pairs that the learner had to memorise, and the learner would be tested on their recall for the word pairs. If the learner got things wrong, the participant was told they had to administer an electric shock to the learner by pressing a button on a quite impressive looking shock generator machine. This machine had a series of switches going left to right with a left side labelled 15 volts, slight shock, and going up in value across to the right, where at the far right hand edge, the labels read very strong shock and then intense shock at the 450 volt level. The participant was instructed to move one step on the shock generator each time the learner got something wrong. To prove that the shock machine worked, they were firstly given a mild 15 volt shock and then ushered to sit down in front of the shock machine as the learner took their position in an adjacent room next door. Unbeknown to them, the actor playing the learner never did receive any shocks at all. As the experiment unfolded, they were put in the predicament, apparently, so they thought, giving ever more painful electric shocks to the learner. To help further convince the participant that real shocks were being delivered, a recording was played that featured the actor yelping in pain at various points when shocks were administered, and as the shocks grew more intense, even asking to be let out, and in one variation, complaining that they had a heart condition. In the first phase of this research, Milgram found that 65% of all participants never disobeyed the experimenter to deliver 450 volt shocks. The average disobey voltage for those who were disobedient wasn't until 360 volts. So even those who did eventually disobey had already gone beyond the point where, for example, they heard the learner exclaim, let me out of here, my heart's bothering me. Let me out, I tell you. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. You have no right to hold me here. After this first phase, Milgram and his team went on to carry out dozens of variations to the basic study. In quite a telling version, the participant was left to decide for themselves what level of shock to administer when the learner made a mistake. The average level of shock chosen was a relatively modest 50 volts. If Milgram had somehow recruited a sadistic sample of participants, we would have surely expected them to cruelly choose high, painful shock levels. 
we're instead left to conclude that Milgram's participants were likely not atypical of the general population. In other variations, Milgram showed, for example, that removing the wall between the participant and the learner reduced but did not eradicate obedience. Also, some factors could even increase obedience levels. For example, getting participants to order someone else to push the buttons on the shock machine greatly increased obedience levels. Across many dozens of variations, Milgram convincingly demonstrated that obedience could be shown to vary systematically in reaction to manipulations of various situational factors. Of course, Milgram's participants were often reluctant, reticent, anxious and quite vocal in their unhappiness about what they were being asked to do. Some showed very visible signs of distress. Contemporary ethical standards would demand that we offer participants an opportunity to leave the experiment if they did seem anxious or in distress. But in the early 1960s, ethical guidelines were scant at best. And so upon querying whether the study should continue, Milgram's participants were given quite forceful oral instructions to carry on by the experimenter, such as, please continue, and the experiment requires that you continue. As well as raising ethical concerns, Milgram's work was controversial due to the unusual explanation he provided for his findings. Arguing that modern societies train citizens to follow authority unquestioningly, he argued that in the experiment, participants entered what he called an agentic state, akin to a kind of altered state of consciousness induced by the powerful situation, which leaves participants with no other way to cope than to psychologically become a puppet of the authority figure. In doing so, the participant comes to allow the experimenter to define the situation and its meaning for them. While an intriguing idea, agentic state theory is arguably the most problematic aspect of the legacy of this work, since it is largely unfalsifiable and untestable. In the 2000s, Alex Haslam and Steve Reiche, for example, came up with an alternative explanation for the findings, postulating that the obedience scene is due to the experimenter and participant coming to share a social identity around working for the good of science. Over the years, Milgram's obedience studies have continued to capture public imagination and foster academic debate. Milgram's work had always had its critics, ranging from those who lambasted Milgram for ethical crimes through to criticism of the relevance of the work to Nazi Germany. One criticism was largely silenced by the work of Jerry Berger. It's often been suggested that perhaps society back in the 1960s was just generally more obedience. In 2008, Berger ran a replication of Milgram's experiment with US college students, but this time stopping when a participant got to 150 volts, arguing that Milgram's data had shown that if a participant had got that far, then a majority tended to continue through to 450 volts. That also reduced the ethical issues. Berger's findings were very close to those of the original study, showing that even modern participants would be obedient, and indeed, showing that female participants were at least as obedient as male participants. So what should be the legacy of this groundbreaking study? It's likely this will be debated for many years to come. In 2015, a Hollywood movie depicting the research was released and renewed the debate that had sparked at the time of its original publication. Are we really all conditioned to blindly obey authority, even when that authority encourages us to harm others? It's perhaps fitting to consider a modern parallel as we conclude our story and bring the journey back to where it began, asking the question, is it right to ask what kind of person commits evil? Or is, instead, it sometimes more relevant to ask what kind of situations encourage evil behaviour? Right now in countries like China, North Korea, Russia, the United States, military personnel sit in underground bunkers, their role being to turn the key that would unleash nuclear Armageddon should they receive the orders from on high. One might ponder what kind of person elects to undertake such a duty. <laughs>
It's hard to think about it because you don't know what's going to happen in that situation. You just have to do your job and, you know, whatever the outcome is, it is. Sobering truth, then, is that these nuclear warriors turn out to be rather mundane individuals, not obviously different in any way to the everyday person in the street at all, not different to you or I. The parallel, therefore, with the Milgram experiment is there for all to see. Just like Milgram's participants didn't look the learner in the eye as they pressed the buttons on the shock machine, so here the teams of missileers never see the human victims who would burn in the nuclear fire they would unleash. And of course the missiles are launched by doing something incredibly mundane, simply turning a key once the launch codes have been entered. So here are the nightmare descendants of Milgram's participants. They are like Milgram's participants, ordinary people put in extraordinary situations. <laughs>